Mechanic SFX, TP9 SFX. Sweet. Is that the competition one? Yeah, that's the one he uses. Nice. Yeah, it's really nice. It's super nice. I've got the uh, the Combat uh, Elite model. That's Dude, that's sweet. Yeah, it's really sweet. Is that their barrel or someone else's barrel? It, all this is standard. That comes standard with it. That's pretty sweet. I like the flat face trigger and everything. Yeah, the magwell. All right, you ready? Yeah. You ready to do this? This okay. show's going to be interesting, huh? <laughs> all right, all right, all right, lead head. I'm back with another episode of the Talking Lead Podcast during the times of lockdown quarantine hopefully they're coming towards the end i know that our town uh, is reopening starting tomorrow Uh, this is may april 30th so may 1st uh, our town's actually starting to reopen and i'm happy about that get to go back to the gym gold is going to be open to a, a limited extent but we can still go and i haven't worked out in like three four months i know it's no excuse i've done a little bit here at the house but you just never can get the same workout at home you know it's just a little difficult so i hope you guys are all doing well and uh i hope that you took part we're giving away a canic tp9 sfx this episode so i've been building it up i gave you two episodes to to get registered to be able to to get qualified to be able to win this, and uh, it, we were in a day we're flooded with entries, uh, but not all of you did what you're supposed to. So not everybody actually qualified. So we're going to be giving that away towards the end of the show. We're going to have Niels Jonason with uh, Canic come on, and we're going to give that away. Uh, but joining me now, ladies and gentlemen, the ever elusive. I mean, I've been trying to get this guy on for. At least I don't know since the last time I was on. I mean, it's been it's been I was gonna say it's been close to a year, if if not longer. Well, other than Shot Show, I mean, I don't count Shot Show. But prior to that, yeah, it's it's probably been about a year since you and I have just done a a Chad and Marty show. Really? Yeah, man. What well, we were on with um, who? Oh. Keith Garcia. Oh, Keith Garcia at Shot Show. Yeah, no, that's that was, no. I was here at the. I was at home. When we did that one. That oh, one okay. Yeah. It's been a while. But anyway, joining me, ladies and gentlemen, you know the voice, you know him, you love him. Chad Enos <laughs> with Keltec. <laughs> but seriously, dude, I mean, people have been asking, where in the hell have you been? Uh, and What's then, going on, everybody? Uh, there was a couple of times that you were supposed to have been on, and then something came up, I had you scheduled, and you just you couldn't do it, so... And then, of course, we've had this quarantine bull crap that's really put a monkey wrench in everything. We were supposed to get together at SHOT Show, or at, uh, not SHOT Show, but NRA. NRA, yeah. We were gonna, You guys were going to be the official sponsors of the Talking Lead Lead Quarters. Yeah. And that didn't happen. We'll do that eventually when, when we can, <laughs> when, when Americans can be free again. <laughs> when we can actually physically touch and look at one another again. Yeah. As if. <laughs> as if we can't do that now. <laughs> as if. I mean, you, this town that I live in, I mean, things have shut down and been closed, but you would never know it. Because whenever I go to the store, I go, you know, I go to the grocery store, I go to Lowe's, Home Depot. I mean, people are out everywhere in droves still. And they that's, have been this whole people, time. Nobody's at work. <laughs> And they got nothing to do. Nobody's staying at home. Nobody's social distancing. <laughs> it's it's ridiculous. Now I've heard some of the larger towns like Nashville. I got some friends that live in Nashville, and they're like, "No, I mean it's like a ghost town in Nashville." I'm like, wow. well, "Why?" Absolutely nothing's changed here at all. Really? So it's just. Yeah. Well, they tried to close the beaches, and the people here weren't having it. <laughs> they so. wouldn't have. They're like, "Screw you! That's our life, man." Yeah, That's and the backyard. And so the politicians here had to back off of that because they're like, my wife and I can't go walk. You know, this people were saying, I, I can't go walk down the beach with my wife who lives with me. Like, it's not like we're giving each other coronavirus. It's only us. And we're walking up and down the beach. Like, I don't understand why the beach is closed. Like, 
Yeah. I get it. Maybe if a bunch of kids are gonna congregate, but you know what? Anytime a bunch of kids congregate and start <laughs> on the beach, yeah, they break it up anyway. So right, what's the freaking point? You but, know, but they're why, either why punish, why they're, punish everybody? Yeah, it's ridiculous. I mean, that made no sense whatsoever. Uh, yeah. And then when you're at the beach, I mean, the, everybody's spread out anyway. Yeah, for the most part. You know, a friend of mine, um, he's a professional surfer. He's you may know him. Uh, his name's Kelly Slater. Kelly Slater. He just, yeah, he just saved by the up. bell. No, no, no. That's <laughs> that's AC Slater. I'm sorry. AC Slater. No, <laughs> no. Uh, but Kelly just said that uh, I, I didn't catch where it was, but uh, somebody, it, and this is totally a scene out of Point Break. Is exactly what I thought. A helicopter flew in, landed on the beach, and they arrested some surfers at gunpoint. What? It wasn't. Yeah, I don't think it was in the states, but yeah. So that's how absolutely absurd this whole thing is, because these these two surfers were in the water, salt water, in salt water. Salt water kills the coronavirus. Oh my gosh! I yeah, mean, there's a there's waste. a jack wagon right there. What an absolute waste! I know. I'll have to find out where that was from. I can look it up while we're uh, while we're talking. So so just bizarre, man. I don't get it. I haven't got this whole thing. This whole corona thing is not. I mean, I'm I see. Well, I'm not going to get into it. Um, you know, I'm a conspiracy theorist anyway, so I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole right now. But if you guys didn't get a chance uh, to listen to the last episode, make sure you go back. It was an excellent episode. We had David Edelman with Mission First Tactical on, and uh, we talked about some less than lethal means for self-defense. Uh, specifically, uh, we focused on pepper spray and, of course, uh, Mission First Tactical is making a line of their own pepper spray, the Rapid Strike, and you can go to their website and check those out and get those. Um, but uh, even if uh, you know you carry, you got a gun, it's always a good idea to have a backup, less than lethal means because you don't always need to use lethal force in every situation. So it's good to have a an alternative solution there. So go back, listen to that episode, uh, and then of course. Uh, you know, got Chad on here now, and uh, we've got that Caltech CP33 that we're still going to be giving away. And uh, it, everything was sent to Mission First, and unfortunately, Mission First and it's they're, now Mission Last. <laughs> their their mission closed. <laughs> their their uh, their state forced them to close. They had to, and uh, of course, that put a hiatus on our giveaway. And it's going to be a good game. We're still going to do it. So as soon as they get back open, up and going, he's going to finish the custom, um, uh, and I say paint. It's not Cerakote. They've got this injecting, injected mold color kind of stuff that they do uh, on stuff. So they're making a custom holster for that kel CP33. Uh, they're going to put some kind of cool design on the actual CP33 itself. Keltec also sent a flashlight, so we're going to have one of your cool flashlights uh, as part of the giveaway. Right on. Uh, and then buck knives sent in a, a fixed blade knife, so we're going to have. Dude, a, yeah. Can I stop right there? Buck yeah. knives is making some amazing stuff. Oh like, my god, it's ridiculous. Everyone, yeah, I mean, I don't keep up with knives, but and I'm sure the people that are into knives and stuff have keeping up, kept up with their marketing and stuff. But when I think of buck knives, I just think of like my grandpa's old knife that I wish I had inherited, right? Yeah. And I now, mean, but yeah, going to the booth since you were doing the show there, I was blown away at them. They're gonna make a knife man out of me. <laughs> <laughs> the, well, they've made one out of me, and I wasn't I was one. Of everything. <laughs> uh, my dad was big into collecting. Uh, folders, pocket knives, and he nice. had, you know, he had just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. But I never got into it. Uh, I'm always, I've always been like a fixed blade knife kind of guy, anyway. Um, but yeah, they're hunting. They're skinners. They've got some amazing hunting knives. They got some great fillet knives. They even got, they've even got cutlery, dude. I made a post on uh, Instagram. Saw that with their kitchen knives. They've got. A kitchen knife set, and you can get them with the deer antler handles, but they're really nice. And you get, and they come with the lifetime buck knife guarantee warranty on them too. So I mean, they're well worth it. Jackpot. So anyway, you're gonna get a, a, a fixed blade buck knife in that 
uh, Fioki ammo is throwing in. I think it's a, a, a certificate for like 500 rounds of 22 ammo of their 22 is this ammo. For, is this all for one person? This is all for one person, man. Dude. <laughs> right. <I must> know. <laughs> so it, it, an awesome giveaway. And um, Smith Bradley watches is throwing in one of their, uh, I believe it's the Springfield watch is the one that they're going to be throwing their new Springfield watch. So we're calling it like the ultimate EDC uh, package giveaways. It's Keltec, Mission First Tactical, Buck Knives, Fiocchi, uh, Smith and Bradley watches, and Talking Lead. And as soon as that's ready to go, we're gonna, it's going to be one of those Gleam giveaways. So you're gonna, the more you go and and like people's and subscribe to people's stuff and share stuff, you get more entries that way. You know that kind of one of those kind of giveaways. But wow. but Mission First is the one that's organizing all that for us, and you know they're kind of they got their hands tied. But as soon as that's available, we're going to give that away. Uh, but today we are giving away a Canic TP9 SFX on this episode. There is going to be one of you lucky leadheads uh, is going to walk away with the same competition gun that Niels uses, and you've seen it in those Canic quick tips for quarantine videos that he's been doing on Instagram. Yeah. Have you seen those fish. yet? Those are pretty cool. No, but I'm going to as soon as we as soon as we get out of here. <laughs> Stay tuned for that. In the meantime, Chad, you know what I hear? I hear that talking lead jack wagon train. Uh-oh. Bring it in, Gunny. Who hey, simplified do or die hold them high at eighth and I. It is time for the talking lead jack wagon of the week, so brace yourself, baby. All right, the train has stationed, and we've got some jack wagons that we want to take care of. And I'm going to go first today, Chad. Do it. I, I normally let my guests go first, but I'm going to go first today. That much of a jack wagon, huh? This this is really irks <laughs> me. This one does. <laughs> and I was out shooting uh, with my buddy Drew the other day, and he brought this to my attention. So. And I wasn't aware of this, but in D.C., in Washington, D.C., there is only one FFL in the whole area of D.C. Whole district. The whole district of Columbia. Of course, we all know how the, the gun laws are there, but you know, recently they were uh, deemed to be unconstitutional and you know, people have been able to get firearms there, although they've made it extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. But... That FFL closed. Shut down. That's nuts. Went out of business. And it, 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 did you say it was in a police station as well? So, so here, here's the story. I'm going to read that. And this comes from PDW, PersonalDefenseWorld.com. And I read several different articles from other places. Uh, but I'm going to read the main one from here. So it says, once again, Washington, D.C. has found itself with a gun problem. No, not the kind of problem the Bloombergs of the world would lead you to believe. With COVID-19 inspired panic buying, driving gun sales all over the country, as well as an ammo shortage, demand spiked in the nation's capital as well. But Washington, D.C. only has one legal FFL holder in the entire city. An overwhelming demand just caused him to shut it down. Overwhelming demand. <laughs> Overwhelming demand caused him to shut it down. What was the shutdown in relation to? So the story goes on, and here's some quote. It said, it like, looked it, like it was going okay. to continue, that there was no end in sight. Charles Sykes, the lone D.C. dealer, told WashingtonPost.com, a person has to know his limitations, and I know mine. So it goes on. Hold on. Wait. And this is a direct result of a city making it as difficult as possible for its residents to obtain a gun, though no handgun ownership has remained legal in the district since the monumental Hiller Supreme Court ruling in 2008. There remains no gun stores in the city. That leaves Skies, or Sykes, I'm sorry, as the only FFL for an entire city. Sykes previously ran CS Exchange, which provided services for civilians, law enforcement, and armed security companies. Uh, for customers, purchase a pistol elsewhere, then they contact Sykes. So 
the state is you have to you can't buy one in that in that uh, that city. You have to buy it somewhere else. But then this is the only place that you can have it sent to to have it transferred to. Okay. So they contact Sykes to set up an individual appointment to complete the transfer. But with this rise in gun purchases across the country, it's hard not to imagine this guy becoming suddenly overwhelmed. Which, what do most people do when they get more business? They hire more people, right? Yeah. Okay. So. Expand. It says, I was getting so inundated with firearms coming in, it got to be too much. Sykes told WashingtonPost.com, I had to stop accepting them. Any firearms that come in now, they automatically get sent back. So, wow. So this guy obviously was ready to retire anyway because he didn't want to grow his business, apparently, because this was the great opportunity for him to grow his business. Um, but maybe the, the District of Columbia made it so hard that he couldn't. I mean, maybe he c- couldn't. I don't know all the details here, and it doesn't go into it. Okay. It says, so the only FFL in town decided to hang it up. For how long, we don't know, but 12 years after the Supreme Court deemed handgun ownership legal in D.C., how is there no gun store? How does what? it not have 10 gun stores? How does it not have 20 <laughs> gun stores in that in that city? Well, I've got I got friends that live in Virginia and they work in DC. And uh and anybody that's a friend of mine is probably y- y- as you can imagine is a firearms junkie sure. just like the rest of us. Well, um if they're driving cuz they have a Virginia permit and all that stuff, you know, if they're driving into DC and they get pulled over, first thing they ask you is about firearms. I think pretty much all agencies do that now. If they so much as find a piece of brass or see brass on the floorboard of your vehicle, mm-hmm. you're probably facing a felony. Really? It's unbelievably uh, tyrannical there um, when it comes to firearms from people, you know, from the surrounding areas coming into D.C. Yeah. So this story it's goes crazy. on. So this guy closes up. So how are people supposed to get their guns? So the city. Uh, goes in, and under a new mayor's order, the Metropolitan Police Department now has the authority to operate as the city's sole federal firearms licensee. What? (laughs) The only entity able to authorize the transfer of guns inside the district. How convenient. Yes, are the very same people that pull you over if you have an AR sticker on the back of your Jeep <laughs> right? and want to search your vehicle for anything, for any way to possibly throw you in jail <laughs> yep. on felony charges. Yeah. So there are no commercial gun stores in this city whatsoever. So all the purchases have to be done outside the jurisdiction. I'm going to be very curious to see how many transfers the, the law enforcement there does. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> on top of that, they've got these fees. Um and it's it, it's a hundred twenty five dollar minimum just to process the transfer, and then they've got all these other fees wow. on top of that. That's crazy. Yeah, it's Never. ridiculous that this guy closes down because he's getting too much business. That just does not make any sense whatsoever. Plus, no. I read something in another article uh, that said because uh, DC has so much restrictions on what businesses can be where. Uh, that he had to close down one his his original place of business his original brick and mortar and he couldn't find another place because nothing met their criteria in that city so the police department allowed him to rent space in their office in their building so he was operating out of their building to begin with I guess that's a that that right there to me is. Uh, law enforcement's uh, version of uh, keep your friends close and keep your enemies closer. <laughs> Keeping the thumb on him, basically. Exactly. Another plan by the man to keep a brother down is all that is. <laughs> what do these people, What do these people think? He's just selling guns to gang members or what? I mean, well, it's you know, it's DC. You know, they don't want any guns, but because of the uh, the ruling back in two thousand and eight, the Supreme Court ruled DC firearms ban was unconstitutional. So they had yeah. to do something. So they're like, all right, 
We'll do it, but we'll make it so restrictive that nobody's going to want to do business here and open one. Yeah. Except this one guy, which we're going to keep him under our thumb and keep him in our office. And now yeah. they've uh, they've if appeared. They just force him. Yeah, just force him to give up. Yeah. Probably what they did. I'm yeah. sure. And there's like, hey, dude, you know, you've been doing this for 12 years. Don't you want to retire? You know, we'll take care of this for you. We'll handle it. I'm sure they're probably giving him a cut, you know, somehow. I was going to say, who knows? It could be anything, man. It could be anything. He, he It could have just somehow politically got him out of there and said, hey, look, here's a half million bucks. Yeah. You're yeah. closing shop. Yeah, he's probably. He's probably down there in uh, Cocoa Beach <laughs> right now. <laughs> Got him a fishing boat. That's where I. That's what I'd do. Man. But anyway, it's very suspect. But yes, that is my uh, jack wagon. Is just that whole scenario there. Oh. Yeah, that's a good one. So I have two jack wagons. One of them uh, has nothing to do with necessarily the U.S., but. What I'm about to tell you is where liberals in this country and the anti-gun people in this country would have us to go. Okay. And, you know, don't let a, a you know, uh, what do they call it? Don't let a Don't waste a good tragedy. Go. Yeah. Okay, so uh, law enforcement in France. Um, so these these surfers were in the water. These couple guys are out surfing uh, in France. Okay. And... Uh, I, somebody knocked him out. Don't know who because um, I, this particular area, I believe, is somewhat remote. You know, surfers tend to try to stay away from crowds so they get all the waves. You know, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. And I just breezed through the story. It didn't I? Didn't there was no real details about that part. But uh, somebody maybe walking along the beach. Who knows? Um, called the cops on these these surfers in the water, and so a helicopter flies in. <laughs> these guys are what? just like you would imagine. A chopper flies in, a little bird with guys hanging out the side, just like our guys would in Afghanistan or something. Military guys with guns. Pointing their machine guns at these guys, and over the the uh, helicopter PA are telling them that they need to evacuate the beach. Oh, my God, at gunpoint. So at gunpoint. At gunpoint. Yeah, because of coronavirus. <laughs> because, just, of, because of the flu. Absolutely <laughs> and utterly absurd. Like, the jack wagon, not just the people or whoever it was that called it in, you know, narked these the the Karen that narked these people out. Yeah, no, it's you Karens out there, but that's a thing right now. Sorry, but uh, <laughs> yeah, and then the jack wagons of the law enforcement that agree to do these tyrannical things, right? Um, and then so well, you said this was in France, though, right? Yeah, yeah, that was in France. So my jack wagon here. Uh, are these governors um, issuing these stay-at-home orders? Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily the stay-at-home order that bothers me. It's the fact that they, they're marketing that that uh, slogan as um, a law. Like, you have to stay home, and you can only go out if you, if you need the essentials or whatever, which right. is absolute and utter bull crap. Read the Constitution. Right. Okay. They can't do that. They can't do that. And so that's what? what's driving me crazy about these these governors. And then they're, the people that – I don't know what it is about it, – it's a generational thing or just a stupid thing. I don't know what it is, like a, a lack of brain cell thing. But I, you got – I think it's education. It's lack of education. Well, it's, it's that. It's lack of common sense because – if the government, they're, they're all in on the government. Like, whatever the government says, the almighty government, that must be exactly what we need to do because these people are smarter than we are, yeah. you know? Like, I'm sorry, but last time I checked, my governor is not a scientist or a doctor, you know? Mm -hmm. And he's not, he's damn sure not going to tell me I have to stay in my house. So, but you got all these people that feel like they, they this is their opportunity to be a vigilante. And so there was a woman who had her kids at the park in Idaho and in the park I guess the guy that maintains the park or whatever called the cops on her they took her away in handcuffs in front of her kids you gotta be shitting me no in freaking Idaho oh my gosh this is America dude and this was like a week and a half ago so yeah, it's so, just it's so, absurd and so the jack wagons are all those d-bags out there calling the police on people that are just living their lives right and the police are D bags and jack wagons for actually yep. enforcing it. So we had a we had a hero last episode, last Jack uh, talking lead episode. Made the leadhead hero brigade uh, because I can't remember where it was. It might have been in Louisiana, 
might have been Texas, but the uh, the sheriff in that district, uh, you know, the governor made this blanket thing saying, you know, we're going to enforce this and you can't do this and you can't do that. Uh, and the the sheriff there said, no, so we're not enforcing that. <laughs> that sounds like our sheriff. He said, he said we're not going to do it. He said, we got our attorneys on it. Uh, we think this is unconstitutional. We think it's against the law, and we're not we're not going to enforce it. Good for him, man. And that's exactly how our, our sheriff Wayne Ivy. Uh, that's his attitude on this whole thing too. So apparently, that's the the attitude that ours has had too here. Because again, everybody's just been out and about, and uh, yeah. And there's not been again. You know, these numbers that you see. My listeners know my feeling on this. I think I think this has just been blown up totally out of proportion. It's been an, an opportunist proportion. Here's the sad part about that. So first of all, I'll just tell you my hero um, are the exact people that you just mentioned, the people that have common sense and that are living their lives. That's my hero for this episode. Good one. Uh, the Fiocchi family has been producing high-quality ammunition since 1876. In 2020, Fiocchi's launching a full line of premium products, everything from self and home defense to the long-range categories. The Fiocchi Blue Guardian line will feature specially tuned products specifically for home and self-defense, featuring lead-free technology and the only NATO-certified zero-pollution primer in the world. Fiocchi's a proud sponsor of the Talking Lead Podcast and the Leadhead Brigade. Fiocchi trains, Fiocchi protects. That's a good transition into our uh, talking lead lead head brigade heroes. Yeah, and so, uh, yeah, and then those and then those, you know, people that actually have um, some authority that are backing those people up, you know, and and this thing is absolutely absolutely and utterly blown way out of proportion. I completely understand. In the beginning, we didn't know what it was. Um, sure. Most, most people, even people in power, didn't have any idea what was going on here. So let's take some precautions. But you can't again force people force a certain lifestyle in in people like you and, can't and force heard, solitude right can't, and, and i've heard people that. compare it to like speed limit signs and drinking and driving or whatever there's nothing to do with that's, any of that no nah, yeah. it's a, it's apples and oranges there it absolutely is Proportion. yeah so if you look at the statistics that they're throwing out there they're they're completely padded because and I've talked, I've talked to the people. Padded in the padded ones are padded. They're padding the padding. They're, exactly, <laughs> it's exactly what they're doing. If you look so at it, anytime anybody dies now, uh -huh. it's it's automatically chalked up to COVID nineteen. They're not shark doing attack. shark attack. Dude had COVID. Yeah, now a shark somewhere has COVID. Yep, and exactly. The whole ocean's gonna die. Heart attack. He had a heart attack. He was shot. He he got COVID. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Guy fell off a building. COVID man. So, and it's, it's that kind of, we're never going to know the truth because no. we, we don't know because these health officials are being told that they have to report it that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course they're going to do, cause they don't want to lose their jobs. You know, they got big fat cushy, you know, jobs. They don't want to lose their jobs. And just, if you look at the like healthcare profession right now, you look at how many people have, are out of work, have been laid off, have been, uh -huh. been fired because hospitals there's no work for them. Nope. So all of this <laughs> stuff that they're saying that people are getting sick and you know, we need all these masks, we need all these ventilators, and they, yeah, you know what? It's not yeah, there. What, if there was no technology and everybody just turned off their TVs, I guarantee you this would have never even happened. Nope. Been business as usual. It has been chalked up to just normal flu. Yep. You know, statistics. Oh, we got a little rise in the flu. You know. Yeah. But, but I get it. You know, people who have respiratory system, uh, uh, respiratory issues, uh, you know, are susceptible to that kind of stuff are, are a little more at risk. They're, they're more at risk just in general, in life. In any, life. Exactly. Any bug, any bug can, can exacerbate that and, and put them in the hospital or even kill them. Exactly. And... I don't know. I mean, we're gonna. It's gonna come out years from now. What this social experiment was all about, you know, the truth will come out. Yeah, I'm with you. I agree. You're not a conspiracy theorist, and and then again, like I said in the beginning, we don't know what it is. It's really difficult to kind of put something like that together. But this was quick, especially in this age of information. This was quickly put together, and a, a lot of people were raising their eyebrows early on this one. Yeah, um, very very suspect from the very beginning. Yeah. Yep. All right, so I'm going to go to my hero, 
And I get these emails from the National Shooting Sports Foundation, NSSFF. Yeah. The SHOT Show people. Yeah. Uh, chock full of all kinds of great information and, and articles. And they had this one, if I can find her. Here she is. Uh, it was about Senator Shelley Moore Capito, C-A-P-I-T-O. So I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your last name wrong. Uh, <laughs> and they nominated her as Legislator of the Year. So let me read this. Newtown, Connecticut. The National Shooting Sports Foundation. Um, <laughs> cut through all the blah, blah, blah. Recognized U.S. Senator Shelley Moore Capito. She's a Republican, West Virginia as the 2019 National Shooting Sports Foundation Legislator of the Year for her unwavering commitment to protect one of our nation's most cherished traditions and for fighting to uphold our, uphold our constitutional rights. Senator Capito sponsored the Bipartisan Target Practice and Marksmanship Training Support Act, which provides states with great flexibility to use Pittman-Robertson funds derived from excise tax paid by firearm and ammunition manufacturers for the development and maintenance of public shooting ranges. Nice. Yeah. So the, the range bill, as it's better known as, paved the way for increased safe recreational target shooting opportunities after it was enacted. Senator Capito also championed efforts to ensure that the National Instant Criminal Background Check System, NICS, Mm -hmm. is adequately funded to provide quality customer service to firearm retailers. And it goes on and, and uh, gives accolades to her. But, uh, I mean, we're always throwing politicians on the jack wagon train. This is one that's actually doing some, some good, especially for our industry and our Second Amendment rights. So, I wonder about her. I, I bet you she's in some form or another a competitive shooter or... You know what I mean? Like, she might be an avid shooter. Hunter. Like I mean, she's from West Virginia, so, you know, she probably grew up with firearms hunting and, you know, that kind yeah. of stuff. But the story goes on. So if you guys want to read it, you can go to nssf.org, uh, and that, that article is there. But, yeah, kudos to Senator Shelley Moore Capito. And uh, uh -huh. she, she makes the Leadhead Brigade heroes this, this episode. Well played, Shelley. Well played. <laughs> 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 you are a what's that commercial where they did that well played there was a commercial dude I can't even remember my name half the time well, that's because you had a motorcycle accident <laughs> bless your heart yeah, that's the excuse <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to run with it <laughs> uh, I think that's all the, the oh I also want to put, like you were putting all the people that uh, are leaving their lives as the heroes, I'm going to put first-time gun buyers uh, on the Lead Head Brigade, Lead Force One. Nice. Can I throw uh, George Kelgren on the heroes thing? Well, we're going to talk about George coming up, so yeah, absolutely. George George always gets, he's like got a reserved seat. Man, wait till you hear what he's done. It's okay, crazy. We're, going to, we're going to hear about that. All uh, right. But, but first-time gun buyers that are going out, they're actually recognizing, uh, you know, they're seeing what this this forced isolation is doing. Uh huh. Um, just here's an article here, and they're just like, here's some quotes from some of the first time uh, gun buyers explain why the coronavirus drove them to the gun stores. Uh, simply put, I wanted peace of mind when it comes to the safety of my family. Nice. Another one. To me, it's all about protecting my family, and if a gun makes that easier, so be it. It's a guy from, guy from California. Level the playing field, bro. My fiancé and I came to the conclusion in early March that if a nation like Italy was going into full lockdown, we in the U.S. were likely on the same path. Given that, and knowing that the police resources would be stretched to the max, I decided to purchase a handgun. Nice. Uh, here's another one. I think a lot of people were afraid of exactly what's happening now. They're afraid if it continues to go on longer, things are going to get worse. My biggest fear is that our local police force comes down with the virus. If the good guys are all out sick, who's going to stop the bad guys? When people have no hope, they get desperate. 
and we Good. fear the right. worst is to come. For some of those communities that are uh, agencies are very thin on uh, p- patrol and stuff, yeah. I mean, even that. before this broke out, they were thin on patrol. That's true. Yep, that's very true. Another quote, just walking on the street, folks have honked and yelled at us for wearing masks. And robberies are common in Asian communities. I worry about them. Wow. Apparently that's somebody that lives in an Asian community. Uh, here's another one. I'm not a real enthusiast with politicians letting criminals out of jails, nor will I be surprised to see crime go up since my police departments are not responding to anything but the worst emergencies. Obviously, this is a pessimistic outlook, but hope for the best, prepare for the worst seems like a good mantra at this moment. So, I like that these people, you know, and these, this is one of the positive things to draw out of this whole thing. And I like it. People are waking up to... Uh, They're actually seeing the real reason for the Second Amendment. Exactly. Exactly. That's where I was trying to go with that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, here's one right here. The sad reality is that civil order can break down in less than 12 hours and the overwhelmed pro- police can't help you. As I explained to my wife, I've seen things go sideways quickly and with unpredictable results. Yeah. This whole thing, think about it, overnight, literally overnight, we got stripped of a whole bunch of freedoms. Yeah. And it, yeah. And this was just a flu bug. So, and it goes on, and this article goes on and on. This is an article I'm reading from Free Beacon, the Washington Free Beacon, uh, uh-huh. dot com. First time buyers explain why coronavirus drove them to gun stores in record numbers. So if you guys want to go check that out, there's more on there. But I mean, it's, it's like, it's like a wake up call for these, these anti, and these were all new gun, first time gun buyers that were making these quotes. These weren't, you know, your, you know, your Chad's and your Marty's <laughs> yeah. uh, going in. I mean, we preach this day in and day out, but it seems like it's finally sinking into uh, more than two million gun purchases in March. So, and I haven't heard April's numbers yet. So there's no telling what what April's up to. Hopefully, it's double. <laughs> I'm sure it probably is. I mean, we'll never get the true numbers out of that. But, but yeah, those uh, those are my. You got any more heroes, George? Yeah, we want to talk about George. So let's wrap let's wrap up our Leadhead Brigade heroes with George. Um. So. Since this whole thing has been happening, uh, we have been trying to deal with it in our own Caltech way. It got down to a point where um, we do have some people that were susceptible, you know, to illness, a couple of heart condition people that work in our machine shop and, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. And so um, they were automatically given approval to go ahead and go home. Sure. And, uh, And then you know, for an undetermined amount of time, but they started with 12 weeks, you know, and they're always basing this off of the new information coming out, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. Well, we ended up losing um, about a third of our workforce because people with small children, it, because the homeschool thing, like this became a nightmare for a lot of people. Yeah, Close, around- schools are closed, yeah, daycares are closed. Exactly. And so uh, we've we're a very family oriented business and just about everyone there has a family, you know? So, uh, and so George out of the, you know, goodness of his heart, just like always, uh, he, he basically told those people that have small children, um, that are in school and some even, you know, high school kids or whatever, uh, stay home uh, until the schools open back up and they're, they're collecting two thirds of their pay. Oh, and they still, and they still have all of their medical and all the other benefits that uh, come along with working at Caltech. So, yeah, a third of our workforce Amazing. is at, at home still collecting two thirds of their paycheck and all their benefits, uh, so they can take care of their families. Yeah, you know, that's and amazing. This undetermined amount of, of time, you know. And so now this down here in Florida, the schools are, are not going to go back into session. We're going straight into summer. So yeah, yeah, these people are uh, extremely grateful for that, and I just George's. He's a hero, and uh, he's finding he's always finding ways for us to stay, in, you know, uh, keep the engine running. And so uh, we narrowed down, we narrowed it down to six uh, products uh, that we're just cranking out. So we just shut down all production on everything except for those six products, which are all the six products that everybody wants anyway. Sure. Uh, 
Um, and so, uh, yeah, but we're not, it hasn't slowed us down uh, whatsoever, even though we lost a third of our workforce for an undetermined amount of time. So, yeah, absolutely. Yep. George is a, a amazing, I'm always innovative. You know, I've always respected him for his innovation that he's brought to this industry and, you know, the aerospace industry as well. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so he, he's about people, not his business is about the people that work for him primarily. Um, we had him on the show when you came, when yeah. you were uh, hosting out of the Keltec booth at SHOT Show. And I mean, he said straight up, this isn't about money for me. Like, yeah. and remember we asked him like, he could have anything in the world. What would you want? He said a boat. <laughs> right. <laughs> there you go. I mean, the man can buy a thousand, he could buy a boat company if he wants to. Yeah. He could have uh, a multi-million dollar yacht if he wanted one. No doubt. Yeah. But that's, that just gives you some insight to the, the type of, person he is and why he does things like this his employees come first no matter what yeah so. well we're going to be talking about some uh some things that george has innovated and and brought to the market we're going to be talking bull pups today yes and um uh, we're not going to like deep dive into bull pups but you know we're going to talk a little bit about we're going to talk about the history talk about some pros and cons and we're going to talk about some of the the bull pups that are on the market and of course you know that's what George and Keltec are known for. Uh, you know they're the first commercially successful uh, company to bring a bull pup to the market, uh, in, especially in the United States. So we, you know we want to talk about that. So let's jump in, Chad, and let's. What is a bull pup? You know what defines a bull pup? What makes a gun, a firearm, a bull pup? That's a, as far as the actual definition, there isn't one because bullpup's not even really a word. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I tried researching that, and um, I don't know what sort of like anecdotes are on the internet now, but uh, from what I found a, a couple of years ago, a few years ago now, mm -hmm. uh, nobody even knows where the name originated. So, so there's a theory that's floating around. Uh, and it, it, the theory is that it comes from Britain. And, uh, you know, they have bulldogs there in yeah. Britain. And, of course, the bulldogs, when they have puppies, they call them, you know, bull pups. And, and bulldogs are known for their compactness. You know, their sturdy, yeah. rugged compactness. Um, yeah. And the theory is that, you know, colloquially, the rifles were called bull pups because they were condensing down, you know, the full-size rifles into a, a compact uh, package. But they don't use the bull. The term bull pups not used anymore in in England either. You know, so that kind of went away. But they just call them bulldog puppies nowadays. <laughs> huh. Well, that's one theory. There were several theories that I read on. Um, yeah. But yeah, so the word bull pup doesn't really. The history of the word bull pup doesn't matter now because we. That's what we call these platforms. So yeah, they're bull pups. Yes, yeah, they're bull pup uh, rifles, but. So, or shotguns. So, bullpup, um, you know, by def by today's definition, is that the uh, the trigger mechanism is in front of the magazine, in front of the magwell, uh, or in front of the action. Yeah. So basically, so, your action is behind the trigger. Yeah, it's behind the trigger, which allows you to shrink the gun down quite a bit in its overall length, but still have long barrel or the barrel length that you that you would like. So. Yes. I know that a, stand, a standard RDB up against another an AR-15 with a 16-inch barrel, uh, the RDB standard is has a 17, 17 more 3-inch barrel, um, up against an uh, AR-15 with the stock collapse. And again, the stock's going to matter because you got certain thicknesses on the pads or whatever. So sure. basically, rough idea, you're looking at four, at least four to five inches shorter right. uh, with, with an actual longer barrel. So for anybody that's not familiar with bull pups, to give you give you an idea on the overall length size. Yeah. Um, and then I wanted to get into the action for our new, our new people, what the action is. And the action is basically consists of, you know, what loads, locks, fires, extracts, or ejects mm -hmm. uh, on the firearm itself. So those, those mechanisms of the rifle, uh, and not all of them, to be considered, but you know, the majority of the the action is behind the trigger, uh, which Correct. what constitutes a a bull pup. In yeah. this particular one, the RDB series, uh, the ejection is downward, which throws a whole nother uh, a whole nother little nice feature into the bull pup platform. Exactly. So let's get into a little bit of the history. 
so we talked about the etymology a little bit, uh, where the name came from. Nobody really knows. Uh, they think it's derived from the from the the bulldog uh, over in England, which they you know they they were the, some of the first to develop the bullpup platform. Uh, but the the bullpup concept was first tested in 1901 with the British made uh, what's called the Thornycroft carbine. <laughs> and it, if you look this thing up, there's a picture of it. And I, I read several articles. Like you had, you know, I did some research. I read several articles. And then, of course, I always go to my go to Wikipedia. Uh, but I want to check and make sure that the information that Wikipedia has is actually, you know, sure. on, on point. And uh, with the bullpup, I think they did a pretty good job based on the articles that I read and how they've condensed it and put it together here. So I'm reading from Wikipedia. So for you guys who want. To know my source here. Uh, the Thornycroft Carbine was one of the earliest bullpup rifles developed by English gunsmith in 1901. The bolt is a bolt action. Uh-huh. Uh, it featured a bullpup action in which the uh, retracted bolt slid back through the stock nearly to the shooter's shoulder. Uh, but I don't think these were actually mass-produced. Uh, but I think that there might have been a few of them. I don't think anything... Was really mass produced in nineteen oh, nineteen oh one. But then he goes on to say it was not until the Cold War that more successful designs and improvements made the weapon successful. In the nineteen seventies, Austria became the first army in the world to adopt a bullpup rifle with the uh, the Steyr Aug uh-huh. uh, as a principal combat weapon. Since then, the military in many countries have uh, followed suit, such as Australia. China, India, Israel, France, and the UK. Would you agree with that? Yep. Okay. I'm looking at pictures of the thorny, thorny crop. Right. <laughs> I mean, it definitely, uh, cat I mean, it fits the build of a bullpup. Everything's behind it. But you think, how could you get that in a bolt action? But they did it. A big old fat stock there. Very interesting. So after World War II, Western engineers drew inspiration from the German Sturmgewehr. 44 assault rifle, which what other famous rifle was derived from that? The AK-47. For you, uh, you AK corner aficionados, we, talk, some. we talked about that in the history of the AK-47. So uh, German, again, German technology is given credit to the birth of the bullpup. The Western engineers your inspiration from the Sturmgewehr, which offered a com compromise between bolt-action rifles and submachine guns. So this guy, Kamizarez Zhuanziski. <laughs> <laughs> Say that five times fast. Which is his given American name, Stefan Jansen. <laughs> <laughs> He's a post engineer who had worked at the Polish National Arsenal during the 1930s. After being mobilized during World War II, he escaped German and Soviet forces and made his way to England where he was part of the Polish design team at Enfield. Oh, nice. Uh, the factory was run by Lieutenant Colonel, this Lieutenant Colonel guy. I'm not going to read all these names. You guys can go to Wikipedia and you can do this, but for you lazy people, I'll give you a, a bridge notes here, Cliff's notes. Uh, so they were looking for a replacement for the 303 cartridge. Uh, the the board decided on optimal seven millimeter cartridge on which Jansen. I had to look at his American name because I can't say his his real name. <laughs> Jan Sue Whiskey, uh, and the two teams working at Enfield had their base designs. One of the designs led uh, by Stanley Thorpe produced a gas powered rifle with locking system based on the Strum the Strum Gewehr. The design used steel pressings, which were difficult to obtain, and the design was scrapped. The result of the Polish design team's efforts was the EM-2. And uh, there's a picture of the EM-2, also nine, known as Rifle Number no. 9 MK-1 or Jansen Rifle. And this was adopted by the British forces in 1951. That's a pretty cool-looking uh, design there, the EM-2. But it was experimental. Uh, it contains some similarities to the uh, AK-47, which I was going to say, it looks like a bullpup AK-47. Uh, although Janusz Wieski had never seen that. I haven't said his name <laughs> the same way twice, have I? 
<laughs> seen the Soviet rifle. The first significant bullpup assault rifle came from British program to replace the service pistols, submachine guns, and rifles. In the two forms of the EM-1 and EM-2, the new rifle concept was born as a result of the experience with small arms that was gained during the Second World War. There's a lot of innovation that came with World War II. Uh, oh, yeah. Especially, you know, with the firearms. Yeah. Uh, so it goes on to talk about, in the Soviet Union, uh, a bullpup was actually up against, you know, when they were trying to get their new rifles for their military back in... Uh, the AK-47 days, there was a TKB-408, which, again, I mean, it looks like a, a bullpup AK-47. Uh, but eventually, Kalashnikov's AK-47 beat the TKB-408 uh, and became their preferred rifle. And but, imagine if they hadn't, what the, what the world would be like now. Right? Instead of the AK corner, yeah. it would be the TKB corner. <laughs> 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 exactly, but that was based on the uh, the seven six two by three nine uh, cartridge. People keep asking us to do a bullpup in that cartridge. Oh, you should. I know you need you need to learn how to take the AK forty seven and turn the AK forty seven into a bull bullpup. We need six thousand more employees. Is what we need. <laughs> I'll be one. I'll send yeah, you my this- resume. There's no shortage of ideas. It's just uh, a matter of executing everything. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So the Steyr AUG, which we talked about earlier, which was one of the first uh, put into military service, uh, it was selected in 1977 uh, and is often cited as the first successful bullpup being in service with armed forces. Well, Uh, it was definitely the first successful bad guy gun in movies. The Steyr AUG, yeah. Oh, yeah. All the bad guys had them. <laughs> the more modern bad guys. Now, the AK-47 and the the, uh, the Steyr AUG, you know, that's the yeah, ones they're, yep. they're rocking. <laughs> so it, it, uh, it was highly advanced for the 70s. It combined in the same weapon the bullpup configuration and a polymer housing. It had dual vertical grips. So you had your, uh, your palm trigger grip and then you had your vertical foregrip. Yeah, uh, and it came with an optical sight as standard and a modular design. Highly reliable, light, accurate. The Styrog showed clearly the potential of the bullpup layout. The arrival of the Famous, which all you Call of Duty players know all these guns by heart. I'm sure that that I'm talking about <laughs> because they're all in in the Call of Duty games. Uh, was in 1978, and its adoption by France emphasized the slide from traditional to bullpup layouts within gun designs. The British resumed their bullpup experiments with the L85, which, again, that's another Call of Duty gun. <laughs> and they've got several different uh, iterations of the uh, L85. Uh, it was redesigned by the British-owned Heckler & Co., which K-O-C-H. You, ca- you call that Co or Koch? I don't call it anything. I just call it HK. HK, yeah. <laughs> it's HK, the Heckler & Co., H and K, HK, whatever. Which they took that L85 and they turned it into the L85A2. Uh, and <laughs> as of 2016, it is being replaced with the L8583. So that was four <laughs> years ago based on this data, which Big is job. lighter, more adaptable, and more durable. Nice. So, and then you get over to Israel. And of course, what do they have over in Israel? IWI. Tavor. Yeah. The table. The Tavers. T- the Tavers. <laughs> That's how they say it down here. The Tar 21s, which is, again, it's a light, accurate, fully ambidextrous, um, designed to stringent. Huh? It's not fully ambi. It's ambi. It's not fully ambi. Okay. Well, they say it's fully ambi here. Well, fully ambi would mean you don't have to do anything to the gun to make it ambi. Okay. It's, it's configurably ambi. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to get into uh, some of the pros and cons, and that'll get into like the ejection and all okay. that, and we'll talk about yeah. that. So I know where you're headed with that. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> designed to stringent reliability to avoid manufacturing in uh, desert conditions. Um, let's see. It goes on to say, notably, it says, the Tavor, the Tavor shares many similarities with the SAR-21, which uh, that is adopted by the Singapore Armed Forces. 
Uh, the South African Vector CR-21, which that looks like something out of like some space movie. <laughs> the the Vector CR-21. It's a 556 yeah. five, by 45. Uh, and then did you know the Islamic Republic of Iran Army developed a KH-2002? Did you know no one cares? Right. It <laughs> is called the Kyber, and there's no picture of it, so I don't know what it looks like. <laughs> and then here's another famous one is the the QBZ95 from China. Mhm. There's another um well-used military. And these are again, if you're a Call of Duty guy, <laughs> all these are in are yeah. except for the Iranian one. I've never seen it. Uh I don't know. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> and then it goes on to say, now I mean, I know what you're waiting for. So there's some sniper rifles, such as the American Barrett M95. So Barrett makes a, a bullpup sniper yeah. rifle. Uh, the XM5000 is also another design by them. The Wather WA2000, WA2000. Never even heard of that one. Uh, again, it's a Call of Duty gun. Okay. <laughs> it's, in, <laughs> it's in Call of Duty. It's uh, it It looks like it would have been in, like in the... You know the 1930s or something like that. It's just got a real boxy, huh. uh, old school design look to it. The Chinese have have a sniper one. The Russians have one. Polish have one. And then of course the United States has one with Keltec. You've got the RFB. The RFB, yeah. It's not a bolt gun though. No, these aren't bolt. These aren't all bolt guns. Some are oh, okay. some are bolt. Some are semi-auto. Okay, yeah, you left off with bolt, a bolt gun the last time. Uh, some so. sniper rifles such as the American Barrett M95, the XM5000, the German Walther. Uh, I think all these are semi-auto, except for one of those Barretts I think is a bolt. But anyway, the uh, the RFB. Talk about the, because that was your first rifle offering. First bullpup rifle, yeah. Yeah, that was, uh, was Keltec's first bullpup was the uh, the RFB, the, the 308. And, you know, I, I always, like, I just, well, we're going to talk about another one of our bullpups here shortly, which I just told my friend today that the one I shot yesterday, which is new to me, um, is my favorite my favorite gun that we make. And then you brought up the RFB, and now that I'm looking at my RFB, I'm thinking that's probably my favorite gun. So it bounces, <laughs> all, over, it bounces all over the place. And then, it's, so I got to start telling people my favorite kel is whichever one is in my hands at the time. <laughs> Well, what you gotta say is my favorite Keltec 308 is. <laughs> yes. My yeah, favorite yeah. nine is this. My favorite 556 five, is this. <laughs> true. True. Yeah. So yeah, the RFB um, stands for uh, Rifle Forward Ejecting Bullpup, and uh, it it actually is like it uh, like it says in the name. It actually ejects forward, and uh, it's a really amazing proprietary design uh, that George came up with. But it's a, yeah, it's a 308, um, and I guess you could look at it as like a battle rifle. Really, it's just it's a tank. It's yeah. just a, a very stout 308 rifle, and uh, for its stout construction, it ha- actually has a great trigger in it, which is another thing that we can talk about with uh, Caltech George. His uh, his mission, he he likes bullpups because you know um, he's Swedish. And um, George is seventy four or five now, so he he kind of goes, you know, he was around, you know, he was a he was a young lad when a lot of these really cool bull pups came out mm-hmm. back in the day. So I think they really inspired him. But yes, yeah, so the RFB was his first rifle, and uh, and he tried to take all the bugs that you would see in those earlier bull pups, a lot of them that you mentioned. Um, one of those bugs being the trigger. Uh, they're notorious for having awful triggers. Yes, yeah, so and that's going to get into one of our our pros and cons segment yeah. yeah that we're gonna so let's just let's do that real quick before you, okay. you get into that so the pros and cons uh, obviously the trigger is one of those uh, and we'll talk about some more but go ahead and talk about the bullpup yeah. notoriously had yeah, bad so triggers that, yeah that in uh sometimes like safety location um and then the biggest thing is accuracy They've all those older ones that you've mentioned for the most part, um, and I'm not talking about the Barrett and the more modern ones, but the older yeah. ones that you mentioned, this, this, the Og and and uh, even the even, the, and- even the earlier Tavors, you know, they they could maybe guarantee you like four MOA <laughs> out of those things. 
So those those you know that whole pot of mess with bull pups. Uh, George was um, and then ejection. Uh, so you know he he wanted to uh, come up with ways to make the gun perfectly suitable for you know right or left-handed person while also getting rid of some of those terrible bullpup uh, issues. Yeah. And so that's why he came up with the RFP. So it's forward ejecting. And the reason and for that is if you were a left-handed shooter, you were getting a face full of brass every exactly. time. Yeah, exactly. And uh, because of bullpup design, again, puts the action behind but, the trigger, which puts it underneath your face. Right. So Your cheek yeah. is on the buttstock. The ejection is right there where you're putting your cheek, and you're getting a mouthful of brass. Yeah, exactly. So with obviously with forward ejection, you don't you you never have to worry about that. Um, and then the the trigger, we still to this day don't know why nobody tried to do this before. Uh, the RFB was designed in 05, uh, built in 06, and introduced in 07. And so think about that. That wasn't really that long ago, and uh, nobody had up until that point, as far as I know anyway. George probably more knowledge about about this but nobody mm -hmm. had actually put the sear engagement at the trigger the sear engagement was always at the hammer end in the back of the gun and that's why they typically have terrible right. spongy yeah. triggers because when so you so far pull, away yeah right when you pull down on the trigger it has to transfer all that energy from the trigger to these action bars that go all the way back to the hammer uh, that it's obviously on spring tension and then the sear was back there and it would let go of the sear and then the hammer would fall forward uh, so George just found a way to just put the sear where it's supposed to be, where the trigger is. So, you know, you can basically tailor the brake to however you want, just like a normal, you know, any normal rifle that's not a bullpup. Right. Um, so, and we, and he's been doing that ever since. Um, so yeah, that was the big, that was the big thing about the RFB. The one, the drawback, the, the only con of the RFB, um, not so much now, but uh, when the gun came out was the cost. Mm. So, and, and also the manufacturing, um, the time it took to manufacture it. Mm. So it was a very difficult gun f for us to manufacture back in the day. Uh, things progress, you know, machines come out, people think of new stuff and, sure. and our engineers try to think of better ways to like make things faster. So now we can crank those things out and drive the cost down a little bit too. Um, and, uh, you know, people ask about the accuracy of bull pups. My, my personal RFB that I have, if I'm running really good ammo, you know, the right loads, um, and I do my part, and, you know, the weather's doing its part, I can get a one-minute group out of it. And oh, absolutely, I actually, I, yeah. I got some that are less than a minute, but I, I would never guarantee that to anybody with, out of any gun, for that matter, which is amazing if you think about how the barrel is attached to it basically straight attached to your optic via the the uh, top rail mm -hmm. so it's not a free floated barrel there's nothing fancy about the gun at all but again if you just do your part and you're running the right ammo it's a very accurate gun and absolutely uh excellent for hunting yeah because of the cartridge and how short the uh the gun is overall so yeah, yeah. now a lot of people are have the misconception you know that because of the bullpup i mean it looks like it's a shorter barrel uh, again, you know, with the, the barrels, you know, all things being equal, barrel length and all that, your overall length is the only thing that, that you're reducing. You're not re reducing the barrel length. So, you know, your distance, uh, your, you know, your, your uh, velocity, ammo velocity, all that's going to be the same. Yep. Yeah. You know, so you're not losing any, any of that. Um, that's right. Durability. You but know, some but of the, uh, some of the other limitations that the other uh, bull pups face, like you said, uh, you know, was the the ejection. So they weren't uh, they weren't um, kind to left-handed shooter, offhand shooters, which that's been addressed with Caltech with the RFB and of course the RDB. We're going to get into that the uh, Down downward ejecting uh, models. Mm -hmm. uh, the charging handles. You know, if they're reciprocating charging handles, again, if you're a left-handed shooter, you're going to crack your nose, your cheek. <laughs> so <laughs> with those. Noise, because you're right there where all the combustion and everything is, is happening. You know, you, you get increased noise, but, you know, if you're wearing your ear pro, you should be fine. Uh, I don't, no to be honest with you, though, I don't I don't even notice that. I haven't I noticed it either. I was going to say, I haven't really noticed a when lot. When I of, switch between, uh, you know, an AR platform and a and the RDB or RFB, I don't, I don't notice it being any louder 
or quieter. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, those are the main, the main objections that people had with bull pups. But again, with today's innovation and in technology, uh, especially with Caltech, those things aren't really issues anymore. No. Uh, and then of course you talked about the triggers you know, bull pups in the past were notoriously known for having very bad precision triggers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, some of the benefits, uh, obviously, you know, is more compact. You get the reduced size. Uh, you're going to l- lose some weight. So they're going to be a little bit lighter. Um, Biggest thing is balance. Balance is, yeah, that's something you're going to get a lot better balance. Now, if you look at some of these earlier designs on uh, some of these bull pups, they were designing them actually to be put on top of, you know, like a bazooka. You know how you put a bazooka over old time days, yeah. you put a bazooka <laughs> over your shoulder. They were, yeah. they were like putting them over the shoulder and they either firing them, you know, from eye level or they were just dropping down to, you know, like hip fire. Interesting. Uh, yeah. There's some, some weird designs that I saw. Uh, but that all got into the balance. And then once you did that, you know, you're bringing everything more to the center and balancing, get an equal balance from, from your rear and your front. Yeah. So that is a definite benefit that you're going to get. You're going to get a lot better uh, ergonomical balance that way. Uh, but it's more easily uh, carried. So, you know, you're a hunter, you're out, all the trees, all the branches and whatnot. You know, I don't want to say it's it's easily concealable. Uh, that's one of the things that they put in here. I wouldn't really call that a benefit. But, you know, storage-wise, you're going to take up less space. True. You know, so True. you're going to be able to, uh, to store it a lot easier. Um what other benefits can you think of? Maybe that I overlooked. I think you know. I think you just. I think you just hit them all. Okay. Um, yeah. The I, I would say one. Uh, you know, up until uh, modern bull pups, I'd say one um, con would be uh, accessory mounting options. Mm-hmm. You know, as opposed to uh, like so. If you had a well, I guess you know, it kind of goes hand in hand with like. Uh, M16 style ARs or whatever, there wasn't really a whole lot of accessory mounting options for those either. Yeah. Until um, the demand was, came out, there really wasn't a, a fix for yeah. it. Yeah. And then as things moved forward with the AR15 platform, and, you know, we started getting hand guards with, a, you know, your a pick rails and you're able to uh, make attachments. So the bull pups hadn't yet caught up to that. Right. Um, but now it's hand in hand. We make uh, an M lock 4N. There's also companies that make other. M lock and uh, pick after rail market accessories, yeah, yeah, aftermarket stuff for for bullpup uh, rifles. So, uh, yeah, back in the day, that was sort of a con. And I think maybe some people um, that just aren't used to the platform, uh, they actually don't like how short they are. Mm-hmm. That have a lot of guys pick up my RFB or my RDB, my competition rifle, which actually has a twenty inch barrel, and they're like. How do I adjust the stock? It's the first thing you ask. How do I adjust the stock? <laughs> like, you don't. That's the whole point in, the, in a bullpup. And so they, they don't know how they feel about that. And, of course, these are people obviously not haven't handled one very often or sure. shot one even. So yeah. um, It's like picking up anything new for the first time. I mean, it's going to be a little awkward to you until you get the feel and under, sure. uh, you know, understand its mechanics. Yeah. And so I have the opposite problem. I mean, I run – I've got ARs and stuff and other guns too, you know, of – a more traditional platform, whatever. Mm-hmm. But every I run these RDBs and the RFBs and the KSGs so often that when I go to pick one of those up, it's a little interesting for me to try to get used to right. <laughs> where everything's at, you know. And the funny thing is, is when I pick up an AR, where most people would have the stock almost extended all the way out or halfway out at least or whatever, I'm cramming the thing all the way to the receiver, <laughs> and then I'm like, you get a little oh, more crap. compact, yeah. Yeah, it's just habit, you know. It's a habit for me. Um, so. Yeah, it's just a matter of get like you just said, getting them used to whichever platforms in your hand. Yeah. But once you do get used to a bullpup, when it comes to like things like uh, storage and meaning, you know, in your vehicle, um, or if cases you use, vehicle, uh, yeah. Yeah, if you use this for home defense or whatever, it takes it's not so obvious in your room, or maybe you can get a smaller safe space for your for your bullpup when you need it in an emergency or whatever. It just takes yeah. up less space no matter where it's at. Or if you throw a blanket over it or whatever, a towel, it doesn't look like a gun. <laughs> you can sleep with it under your pillow. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, so then, if you know, God forbid, you are ever in a situation where you had to deploy your rifle uh, in your house, having a bullpup's a huge advantage because of its compact uh, size. You're able That's to keep point. the bullpup 
Yeah. Yeah. One of the big things is uh, you're able to keep the muzzle level uh, while you open doors. Yeah. Um, you, obviously, you don't want to muzzle yourself, your hand or whatever, but you can stay up on your sight and still reach up, you know, pull a, a door open or push a door open and still have your muzzle down range and ready to go as opposed to having your muzzle up or down. And then when the door opens, you got to take that that second to get the gun down and then get your, your right. eyes on your optic. So that's a great point. Keith likes everything about the great outdoors. He's a lot like us. Whether we're bow hunting in the back country or plinking in the backyard, we want to enjoy each experience to the fullest. kel 22 caliber P-17 is Heath's go-to pistol for a good time, on the range, on the trail, and anywhere in between. Weighing in at only 14 ounces with a full magazine, its compact size makes it easy to conceal or tuck away in a small pack, pocket, or space. It comes out of the box ready with a fiber optic front sight, a threaded barrel, a Picatinny rail, and a price point for any budget. With three 16-round magazines, it's ready for hours of pure, unadulterated enjoyment. It's easy, it's affordable, it's accurate, and it's a damn sweet marvel of plinking innovation. The Keltec P-17. It's more bang for less buck. And that also is beneficial for, um, for you know, smaller framed people, mm -hmm. uh, you know, women, people with shoulder problems, uh, people with wrist problems. You know, there's definitely a lot of, uh, a lot of benefits to that um, where most, you know, where some people just, they get fatigued holding up a traditional style rifle for too long, yeah. which may, you know, unfortunately that discourages a lot of people from going and training, you know. That's true. With the rifle and stuff, so. They go to the range and they shoot off the bag the whole time, you know, and then, you know, they're not going to be able to shoot off their bag when a bad situation goes down. They need a rifle. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, hold know. on a minute. Let me get my bag. Yeah. So, no, I mean, that's, I'm just being silly, but, um, yeah, it is definitely a benefit for people that may have some issues with the joints and stuff or, uh, again, just, you know, smaller people and, uh, you know, women. When I hand this uh, RDB to this this new defender model to women, they're like, this is, this is it. I got to have one of these. Cause it's just real easy for them to hold up and point, you know, mm -hmm. there's not a whole ton of oversway, mechanical oversway and stuff like that. So yeah, it's, it's even more balanced than the well, stuff. We, we, then that well, gets us into the, uh, you know, the five, five, six, the, the RDB, mm -hmm. you know, which is, uh, it's going to be even lighter. Yeah. More maneuverable. Uh, talk about the the Keltec RDB and versus the RFB, the forward ejecting versus the downward. Ejecting. Yeah, so RD, RDB stands for, and I don't name these guns by the way. So anybody out there that is like <laughs> hate on the names, I know there's a lot of people. There's a ton of people that love Keltec. They hate the names of our guns. But uh, so just so we're clear, I don't name them. Like if it were up to me, I'd do what Peter Palma said and call him like the Tiger Shark or. The Come up with your own name for them, yeah. <laughs> or whatever, yeah. But RDB stands for Rifle Downward Ejecting Bullpup. And uh, so, yes, George figured out a way to uh, have the the brass come out uh, behind the magazine um, and straight down. So uh, we talked a little bit about something being, and I'm using air quotes, fully ambi. <laughs> uh, these guns are out of the box, fully ambi. Um, you don't have to buy you know, spend more money on an ejection kit, um, to, to get, to get it to eject out the other side, it just comes out of the box that way. Um, the only thing that you have to do and you don't have to buy any special parts and it only takes two seconds to do. Um, if you're a lefty and you prefer your charging handle on your, uh, you know, on the weak side, your non-dominant side, uh, you just pull the handguard down one pin, pop that out, pull the handguard down, unplug it and stick it in the other side on the Switch RFB. Yeah. Yeah. And then the uh, the RDB is not much more complicated than that either. So um, very, very easy to make the gun fully ambi. So uh, that's how these things come out of the box. And the KSG, uh, our bullpup shotgun, uh, is actually fully ambi. There's nothing that you need. It's a pump-action shotgun. So yeah. right out of the box, left, right hand, it doesn't make any difference. And then you got the um, – so we, I mean, we're getting into the shotguns also, and there are – other examples of bullpup shotguns that are out there too, uh, yep. but Keltec, you know, famous for the the KSG, and again, uh, for you Call of Duty players, uh, Andrew, uh, what's the other one? Um, 
uh, what's that other game? They've got the RD, the RDB is in that game too, and I use it all the time. Black Ops, or was that? No, it's not the call. It's the other. It's the one that has the huge maps. Um, I don't play video games at all. Oh, I my do. Boss, I play them. Um, my boss is so disappointed in me because he's a video game freak. But the KSG, the RDB, or it's the RFB. It's not the RDB. It's the RFB that's in it. Battlefield. That's what. Uh, that's yeah. Yeah. Battlefield. Uh, it's that's like my go-to rifle uh, in that video game. <laughs> but it's 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 really cool that the accuracy that they put into these video games with the firearms as far as um how they feel like the controls feel and stuff. Well, yeah, just to, and how they how they actually operate uh you know, how they would operate in real life. Uh, yeah. It, it's kind of really cool how they do that, but I mean, it's it does it's it's not exactly how. I mean, there's nothing like shooting a real RFB, you know. So. Well, yeah. What what are you shooting now? Uh, oh, I just. It's like uh, a race gun. It is, yeah. One of the dogs had uh, knocked over my three gun gear. Well, this... don't shoot him. <laughs> don't shoot him over it, Chad. Come on. No, I just I hadn't picked up my. Uh, <laughs> I, my competition pistol is a STI DVC, and it's just it's a really sexy gun. I just wanted to handle nice. it for me. I had uh, Todd Jarrett on a few episodes back. Nice. And we were talking uh, talking about the staccatos. Yeah, you know you have to get on is uh, the Kraken. Uh, Jim, Jim Irwin. Jim Irwin? Yeah. He's been yeah. on. I know. <laughs> not lately, He's, though. I need to get him on. He's not been on in a while. Been a while, yeah. He's what? a great storyteller. Is he uh, with STI? He is, yeah. Okay. Yep. I didn't know if, uh, who he's with now. They, I think they, they just like sponsor him. Yeah. And his, um, I need to go take a class with him and stuff. I just, him and Annalise are just fun. They're great people to be around. I just. Uh, oh yeah, he's a yeah. hoot, man. He cracks he me is. up. He is. Yep. You would never know. American hero. <laughs> what, yeah. What he did in a prior <laughs> life. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, but the, the shotguns, you know, we we're talking about the, uh, the KSG talk about how that came to be the KSG. Um, well, okay. I'll, I'll tell you my first experience with the KSG. I had no idea that George was even working on anything. And at the time <laughs> I was working in uh, the test fire range and, uh, he would come down there and with a bag, he'd have a gun and I've, I've learned this over the last 12 years that his MO is to hide everything from everybody or try to. <laughs> well, he thinks he's being sly by bringing whatever he's working on down to the range in a bag. <laughs> so that's the telltale all, that he's got something new, huh? Yeah. First of all, it's the president and lead designer of the company coming down to the test fire range. What do I think he's going to be doing down there? Like, <laughs> you know, you just want to come down and shoot some PF nines. Like it's bringing his it's lunch silly. down there to eat. Yeah. Yeah. It's like silly for him to even hide the fact that he's working on something new. Right. But so <laughs> I'm relatively new at the company. I didn't, I mean, I knew who he was, but I didn't, didn't even think about it. Right. Right. Comes down there with a bag and uh, opens it up and it's, it's the first prototype KSG and he's trying to work, you know, work on it and, you know, figure out what he wants to do with it and stuff this is a like working prototype. Right. And, uh, I was the first person to see this thing outside of his office, uh, in the engineering department. Yeah. And, um, he pulled it out of the bag and I went, good Lord, what is that? <laughs> Cause I, I knew it had to be, it was either 12 gauge or something completely wild. A like laser the, again. Yeah. <laughs> I just saw the, the huge bore and I was like, I, I don't know what that is, but George, I want that. I want one of those. And this was a pretty crude uh, prototype. Like it wasn't, you know, it didn't look really nice. And the, you know, obviously the polymer wasn't finished yet and all that stuff. Right. But uh, yeah, so he took it out and um, he's like, I, he's Swedish, his accent. I, anytime I talk about George or impersonate him, I, you have to do the I. Cause <laughs> is that how Swedish people do? They go, I. <laughs> he does. Uh, Aye. So anytime it's it's either good or bad, kind of like Canadians go, eh? Exactly. Yeah. Well, I don't want to say it's a Swedish thing; it's just a George thing. Okay. But he, he the inflection of the I is is indicative of what his next thought is or what he's thinking. So it's either a really good thing, like I, like 
that's good or hey, that's yeah. bad, right? And there's variations in between. So he pulls it out. He's like, hey, like I wasn't supposed to see it, right? So uh, I was like, what is that? And um, he's like, it's a shotgun. <laughs> I said, can I shoot it? And he goes, he looks around. And he's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and he showed me how to load it and, you know, he showed me the selector switch and it was a pump action or whatever. Dude, that was a that was a pretty amazing experience because I literally shot the first prototype KSG and I shot it with George himself, you know. So this came and, out uh, what about 2011? Uh, 2010 is when I saw it for the first time, early 2010. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, we introduced it in in uh in 2011. In fact, that prototype shotgun I took out into the desert with uh, Nut and Fancy back in the day. Oh yeah. Uh, it was early in 2011, and uh, I was probably watching ran, that video. Yeah, ran ran that shotgun out. This it's pretty wild. We still have it. Um, you still got the prototype? Yeah, we still have it around. Oh, dude, is there any way you could send me pictures of that? Of course. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah, I mean, I think we we're allowed, we're allowed to go back to the office on Monday, so I'll be able to get you some some shots. But okay, cool. Yeah, so that was my first experience with the KSG, and um, and I didn't nobody really knew it was coming like george just kind of worked on this quietly in his office and then uh he he brought in um there's one he has a right hand man at at uh, caltech um his name's lyle mm -hmm. and uh he's the one that puts all of the parts or brings all the parts to uh reality so george puts them on paper and then uh, he and lyle actually take go get material and uh program the numbers in the machines and then cut up the parts and put the guns together. That's how they prototype stuff. It's pretty neat. <laughs> so that's awesome. Lyle, Lyle knew about it, obviously, uh, you know, obviously George and, uh, there may be, you know, one or two engineers up in our engineering office that knew what he was even doing, what he was up to. Yeah. And, uh, our engineering department has actually grown quite a bit since then. So it was even smaller back then. Um, but yeah, he just, it was just something just like everything else. He, just wants to do something and so he puts his mind to it and and then a couple of years later we we have a a product it's weird <laughs> yeah. and i wish it was more i wish it was more exciting and more complicated than that but it really isn't you know george george wants this he wanted a 12 gauge shotgun that had two tubes and it held a massive amount of ammo but it was only two feet long that's compact in his mind, in his mind he's like you know what that's that's i want to make one of those you know and and then so he I, did it he, yeah, he made it reality, you know, and that's the great thing about him, you know, is his visions yeah. become reality. He sat down at the computer and, and, and you know, the, that KSG is probably, there were probably 15 KSGs that were thrown away, ideas that were thrown away. And that, when the one that we have is the one that, you know, we ended up, yeah. he ended up building or whatever. So but that's the thing too, is it, it, it's evolving too, because you guys came out recently with the KS7. Mm -hmm. which you know, is a is a even more lighter compact single barrel uh, or single yeah. tube not barrel um, and so that that actually ryan williams one of our engineers who's also a cop uh law enforcement uh he um uh, he actually designed the ks7 um you know obviously built off the ksg sure. design. inspired by him yeah. yeah he's also the guy that uh, brought us the gen 2 sub 2000 as well oh yeah we're gonna talk about that a little bit here yeah a uh, little bit of a doesn't fit into our 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 bullpup, but again, the compactness and whatnot, it's you know, it'll fit yeah. into that. But well, uh, after after you fold it, technically it's a bullpup. That's right. I, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't uh, operate, but it uh, turned into a bullpup, definitely. Bullpup. Yeah. So for each Caltech, there's you know, George has design ideas. There's 15 design ideas for other guns for every gun that you see, and. Um, his son, who's my boss, Derek, um, he actually had to tell his dad to slow down. <laughs> really? Yeah, George. Like, George take it easy, Dad. <laughs> yeah, hey, pump the brakes a little bit. We, we're like at capacity right now. We can't introduce two more products. We introduced four products this year in 2020. Four. Four products? Yeah. So I'm Sorry, thinking... not 2020. 2019, we introduced four products. Yeah, so you did the... Um, CP33. Oh, okay. Piece. The CP33, yeah. the uh, the other 22, which is the... P17. The P17. The KS7. The KS7 and the... 
and now the well RDB Defender, um, which is basically a, an RDB survival, but it's tactical. It's got a yeah a aluminum M Lock four, and so that's I mean technically it's a new product. Um, it is, but but then also the the sub two thousand integral yes, super. So well, that's, that's five. Well, that's technically a 2020 introduction. So these these guns were ready to be introduced in 2019. So yeah, yeah. But I mean, think about that. I mean, and you know, we're a company of 320 people. <laughs> so yeah, it's wild. on top it, of all the other products that you already have out. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So and yeah. but George has, as far as I know, and he showed me the these designs himself on his computer. Um, but he showed me eight new, oh, sorry, after that one, it'd be seven, seven brand new designs that are in the AutoCAD, ready to build parts for and and start prototyping. You're gonna like, be, are you going to be like innovative ground shaking people are going to be just like when the... Dude, these things blow my mind. I think last time we talked, I told you this too, but like just when you thought everything had been done, he shows you drawings and you're just like... Oh, yeah. Dude, yeah. this is crazy. I want one. <laughs> Can you make that drawing a gun right now? Because I want to take it home right now and go shoot it. Like, yeah. just I some, mean, it's got to be one of the best places ever to work. I mean, it's like working at Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. You know, he comes out <laughs> with a new, a new chocolate thing, and you know, you want to eat it. it. The only problem, the only difference is everybody gets a golden ticket. Man, it's crazy. <laughs> but uh, that's awesome. Yeah, it is. A, it is a fun place to work. But yeah, just so the listeners know, we we are in, in no way, shape, or form slowing down. Um, are there are there more uh, bullpups coming out? Is that something we got to look forward to? Uh, can I say that? Possibly, you say possibly. <laughs> uh, I I'll, I don't know. Probably. <laughs> probably. I'd mean? tell you what. The next thing that's uh, that's coming up is uh, something people have been asking a. It's it's a completely different platform, all new platform. It's not a variation of anything we've done before. Okay. Um, but it's a gun. AK-47? It's, it's a cartridge. No, I can say no. It's not. It's not, not an AK-47. AK okay. No. <laughs> it's a sandwich. Um, but it's a caliber people have been wanting us to do for a very long time. I got gotcha. you. All right, so let's get back on track here. So bullpups, uh, we talked about the, the RDB... The RFB, your 308, your 556, the 12 gauge, um, is yep. is definitely uh, you know cons is considered a bullpup. So 12 gauge, and there are other ones out there. You know, I was I was getting into that. Um, what are, what is? And this, I mean, if you want to call it competition, your competition. But what are some of the other bullpups, 12 gauges that are out there? I, they're not coming to me right off. Oh. Um IWI had one. I don't know what happened to it though. Yeah, it uh, just came out too this year, right? Or at Shot Show. It was supposed to, and then they. But there's the um, the Utahs, um, and then there's that DP12. The DP12. Yeah, that's yeah. the one. Yeah, I've heard of it. And then the Utahs, that Turkish. The U uh, I shot. I've shot the Utahs. Hated it. Absolutely hated yeah. that. Uh, the IWI Tavor TS12 is. Yeah, is the one that. Uh, but that's a semi-auto. Yeah, semi. Yours is a pump. Theirs is a semi-auto. Uh, yeah. Bullpup. I didn't get a chance to shoot it uh, at Shot Show, but uh, I heard a lot of people talking about it. Well, I'm if looking they, at Brownells right now, and they got one for sale for fifteen hundred dollars. <laughs> if you want to drop fifteen hundred bucks on one of these things, they weigh. Uh, it's barrel length of eighteen and a half inches. Uh, overall length twenty eight point three four. It's twelve gauge, got a fifteen plus one round capacity. Uh, so there's just some specs on it, real quick. But yeah, I think I don't. I think it has a rotating magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, rotate with your hand. Yeah, I'm not sure. But anyway, that's you know that's like the most recent one that's out. The other ones that you mentioned, the Utahs, the DB twelve is one is. And those are all semi, or not semi, but those are all uh, pumps. Yes. Also. Yeah. 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 The DP12, I believe you pump it once and fire twice, pump it once, fire twice. <laughs> okay. And the, they, I think they've since fixed it. However, when you would pump it once and fire one shell, 
you could not engage the safety. Oh. And so it's very dangerous in case if you That's slump. right. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. But I, I believe that was just the initial, uh, to, you know, in all fairness, I think they did correct that uh, that issue. And there are other, I want to say, There's weapons. Ones. There's other weapons that are considered bullpup, too. The military's got several well, the experimental type things that they're yeah. working on now. Larger caliber type type things. Yeah. Um, yeah. Explosive ex- grenade type stuff so nice i saw yeah, but, saw some stuff when i was doing the research the platform itself makes absolute sense to me yeah. um in other words why have something that's not balanced you know i mean at least today like we talked about earlier with uh, modern technology and materials uh, there's no reason we can't make bullpups the norm you know yeah. so, and when you were talking you know earlier about that they have fixed stocks I eventually see in there being some sort of a, you know, adjustable stock also. On of those. course. And I'm, I'm sure there's probably aftermarket companies out there that have already done something like that. Like, in other words, for ours, could be. I had the idea and um, I had talked to a friend of mine at Magpul. And uh, what I wanted them to do was for people that are just have real monkey arms, you know, it makes sense to have something that extends a little for them. Yeah. And I thought, uh, you know, what they could do is easily re- pop it on top, um, pull the assembly pins out. There's only two of them. Uh-huh. Pop it on top, stick the pins back in, and then they have something like the thumb screw for both the the comb and the yeah uh, the extension or whatever, something like that. I think you're onto something there. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it, an aftermarket company that that does polymer could have a field day with that. So it's definitely not an issue. Yeah. Very cool. Well, I think that about covers uh, everything that I want to cover uh, on this episode for the bull pups. Cool. Uh, definitely, I mean, this is something that we could get into maybe uh, in other episodes, and we could deep dive into the specific uh, types of, of bull pups and go down the road on each one. Uh, it might be something that I do down the road, but uh, yeah, if you guys have any questions about the bull pup or the Caltech KSG RDB RFB KS7 in particular. Uh, shoot me an email talking at gmail.com or you can just send them straight to Chad because that's who I'll <laughs> that's who I'll be calling to get the answers from. <laughs> yeah, you can always hit me up on our uh, on the Caltech social media as well. Um, I don't answer e- like uh, I know you can message people on Instagram. I don't answer those. I try to get to the messages on Facebook occasionally, but I'm always in the comments. So if you throw a, a question in the comments, I'll probably answer you there for sure. Very cool. Is there anything else you think that we need to uh, cover on the, the bull poach? You think we got everything covered? Yeah, I think for, for a general yeah. overview, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I would like to mention that the the RDBs take standard AR-15 magazines. That's kind of a big plus, you know, yeah. so they're not proprietary mags. Uh, and the RFB, you can actually buy those mags for very cheap um, from Thermold, and there's a couple other companies that make them too, so... Very common magazines. That's one of the questions I get asked a lot is, can I put my AR-15 mags in my RDB? And yeah. I say, of course you can. Is the uh, the RFB or others the FAL mags? Yeah, they're the FN FAL metric mags. They make a one-inch pattern. Um, we made them to take the metric ones. They're a little smaller. I got you. And are you producing your own mags for those? No, actually a company called Thermold. Okay. Uh, makes those for us, and they're excellent. They don't look like much, I'll be honest with you, like, you're going to pay like 12 bucks or whatever it is for this thing. Yeah. You're going to get it in the mail and it's going to look like it might be kind of flimsy. They're <laughs> excellent magazines. In fact, I've been running the same like three or four thermal mags for all of my demo guns for years and never had a problem with any of them. Okay. Well, that's so, a good testament right there. And can they order yeah. those from your website or do they have to go to that, that company? Uh, no, they have to go to thermal and it's a, uh, T H R E M O L D. Okay. Uh, so kind of a play on th- a thermal, but thermal. Thermal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, great company, and also DS Arms. Uh, DS Arms. Everyone's pr- pretty familiar with DS Arms. They make the uh, metal magazines uh, for the RFB. Gotcha. But you want the you want the metric pattern ones, not the foul one inch pattern. So that's good to know. Yep. Now. Real quick, I know our listeners are chomping at the bit. They want to know if they're the winner of this uh, Canic TP9 SFX. The answer is yes. They now, are the winner. We're just we're just waiting on uh, Niels here. We're killing time till Niels calls in. Real quick, and we mentioned, and I did a video with it when I was at Shot Show. 
the uh, the new sub two thousand, the integrally suppressed uh, sub two thousand, which you're calling the CQB. CQB. Yeah, it's the sub two thousand CQB. Yeah. So talk about that real quick. Yeah. So that is. I just shot it for the first time yesterday. Well, I shot it at range day, but I took it out for my own personal fun and training uh, yesterday. And I immediately put it back in the truck with a full mag in it. I'm like, this is my get home gun for yeah. sure. Like, uh, but I was shooting the um, the uh, sub, um, 165 grain subsonics uh, hush ammo from Freedom Munitions because I just happened to have a stash of that. Sure. And Because uh, I used to know a guy. Yeah, <laughs> uh, when you pull the trigger, and I, sh I shot it at the berm on purpose just to see, hear the actual sound of the gun, and I'm going to be posting video up on our website and on our YouTube channel all that stuff so you can really kind of get a feel for all these things we've been talking about. Um, but when you fire, the gun is so quiet, you literally hear the bullet make the thud sound at the at 50 <laughs> yards. Yeah, You hear the bullet like hit hits the dirt, and it's just as loud as the the gun itself. Like... It's so, that's how quiet it is. When you fire, you never hear the gun if you're shooting steel. Yeah. You only hear the steel ring. Yeah. It's wild. That's what impressed me at, uh, at uh, SHOT Show at the range day was how quiet. I mean, even though there's other people shooting and stuff like that, uh, you could still tell because I've shot so many suppressed guns, you know, you just, you yeah. just tell. And, yeah, so and how smooth it was, too. So we made we made honest liars out of Hollywood, basically. So they've been, <laughs> they've been lying to us about how quiet suppressors are, you know. And we finally made a gun that's actually as quiet as Hollywood thinks they are. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. It's, but it's uh, it's a neat gun. It still folds, so it's integrally suppressed, as you mentioned. So it's got a four point three inch uh, inches of rifled barrel, mm -hmm. and then the rest of it is a high volume suppressor. So it's essentially still a 16-inch barrel. So you're never, you're not ever going to pay for a short barrel tax stamp. You're only paying for the tax stamp on the suppressor part right. of it. So it's a single tax stamp weapon. The handguard actually, the whole foreign rotates out of the way, so you can still fold it uh, with your optic on there, uh, which is a really, really big plus. Yeah. And, uh, your listeners are going to get a whole lot more information about it. The MSRP is around 900 bucks. Um, That's amazing. But, if you look the MS, yeah, the MSRP of the sub two thousand itself is five hundred, and if you look at a quality nine millimeter can, you know you're looking at probably five to eight hundred bucks, you know minimum. Yeah. Just for that, so and that's MSRP nine. That's not necessarily going to be street price. Sure. Uh, nine bucks. So you. I may, mean, that's still is uh, put me down. <laughs> yeah, you may, you may pay. Put me down for two, Chad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You might pay quite a uh, quite a bit less, you know, probably more in the seven hundred dollar range, um, and then plus yeah. your two hundred dollars tax stamp. You've got a, you've got a, a pistol caliber carbine that's crazy accurate, crazy quiet, folds, you know, and, folds up with your optic and on it. And maybe through all this coronavirus, uh, you know, discombobulation with our uh, our politicians, maybe we can get the NF NSF. What is it? The uh, Oh, the Hearing Protection Act? Yeah, the Hearing Protection Act squeaked through. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Democrats only seem to be the ones that sneak crap through, so... Yeah, well, we, maybe we can uh, turn the tables on them here with the, exactly. with all this, and then you won't have to pay the additional 200 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. So anyone familiar with the Sub-2000, uh, the platform exa is exactly the same. The only thing that's changed is the barrel. And uh, so we'll take lock mags, and then we'll also have... And the weight on this thing, too. I was really surprised. I was expecting it to be... You know, a lot heavier too. It's, it's like I couldn't tell the difference between. Actually, it felt lighter than. It's yeah, it's it's super light. Um, but it's you know, it's got steel parts where all the steel parts are necessary. The the two the first two baffles are steel. Yeah. Uh, the rest are aluminum. Um, and I mean, you're never going to shoot the baffle. Not, the average person is never going to shoot the baffles out anyway. Mm -hmm. But if you had to, uh, and you want to. You, if you had to shoot the baffles out because you're training a lot and having a good time with the thing like you're supposed to, <laughs> um, the baffles are super easy to replace. They're super cheap. And all you have to do is spin the end cap out and tilt the rifle up and the, oh, cool. the baffles fall out. So super easy to maintain and clean. And if you need to replace any baffles you know, down the road, yeah, uh, it's no problems. So Yeah, yeah that's, that's, a, that's probably hey, my, um, my most anticipated gun that I want to yeah. have. Yeah, hey, that's a... 
compliment. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you know how I felt about the sub two thousand to begin with. So that's true. That's true. Yeah. You and, are a fanboy of the sub two K. And now As that it, you've thrown the can on there, it's just oh my god. Yeah. And the crazy thing it's the is perfect it's perfect gun. Like, it's just as accurate as the. I guess I was a little worried about that short barrel when I was getting, you know, stretching it out the distance. But a uh, uh, AB target at 100 yards was no problem. Yeah. With that thing. So. So when yeah. and that is that on your website now? People can go and check it out. And I actually uh, the reason um, I was late to do the show today <laughs> is because I was I was doing a photo shoot uh, with that gun uh, today. So we're putting all the content for the website together uh, okay. right now. And uh, I have all, I've already typed up all the- Coming soon. What's that? Coming soon to the website. Very soon, yeah. I've already got, everything's laid out. We just didn't have any images. So we just got to slap the images on there and we can put it up on our website. Cool. I did see an image that you posted uh, the other day that you had the Defender and you had that together. Yes. With it. Yeah. That was pretty that was, freaking sweet. That was range day uh, yesterday, I think. I can't even keep my day straight, but. Um, yeah, I had the best time. <laughs> I was, that was I hadn't I hadn't gotten any guns out in quite a while, um, and that was the most fun I'd had. It wasn't pretty. It's was kind of like watching a newborn. <laughs> I I feel you, man. It's like watching a newborn giraffe drive a go kart. You know, it was ugly, but that was it, me like two weeks ago. <laughs> I went out to, and shot for the first time, and I don't know how long. It may have been way too long, uh, and then I went out again uh, the other day and. It's like, man, I just why why am I not out here more often? You know, exactly, I know. I need to get out there more too. And I actually set it up with the guy um, who kind of schedules that range to actually force myself to get out there a couple days a week, even if it's just for an hour. Well, that's what you got to do. Sometimes is you got to you gotta, accountability. You know, you got to yeah. assign accountability to a friend to. Uh, yep. Exactly. Keep you on he's, target. He's, He's relatively new to firearms, at least the training part of it anyway. And so he's he's like, that's all he wants to do. You know what I mean? So I told him, like, you need to drag me out here. So yeah. I'm going to commit to doing at least a couple hours a week with you. And he's like, okay. I'm His new play. enthusiasm reinvigorates your old enthusiasm. Exactly. And then yesterday, getting out there and playing with these two guns, I didn't want to set them down. Oh, I mean, man, I can imagine. <laughs> I ran out, of, ran out of ammo, and I was like, what a bummer. Like. <laughs> If I was only I had more ammo. Yeah. So. Well, very good. Uh, Chad, are you ready to give away a gun? Of course. All right. Niels is ready to join us now, so uh, let's let's do this. I know you lead heads are ready. All right, lead heads. The time has come. It is here. Everybody's been biting their nails. You've been on the edge of your seat. You've been cussing me to get to this point of the show and it's here the giveaway the canic tp9 sfx giveaway with obviously canic usa and our good buddy nils the sponsored shooter of canic is here with us he was on episode 344 and uh, he had some great tips while you're in quarantine for your dry firing and your home drills uh, Nils, are you as excited as I am to give this thing away? I am always excited to give guns away. You bet. <laughs> yeah. We're, so we're giving away the same gun that I shoot for all of my competitions right now. It's the Canik TP9 SFX, and it is a beast of a gun. So yeah, I'm super excited. It is a beast of a gun, and just just out of the box, uh, this is what it comes with. It comes with your industry standard dovetail sight cuts that are compatible with a large variety of aftermarket sights. You've got worn tactical sights with red and green fiber optic front sight. You've got a removable red dot cover, four red dot interface plates, match grade barrel, improved single action trigger with a three and a half to four pound pull, lightning cuts on the slide to reduce muzzle rise, forward slide serrations, reversible ambidextrous cocking lever, extended ergonomic slide stop, adjustable length reversible magazine catch, two extra sizes of magazine catch extensions in addition to standard magazine catch, striker status indicator, you got the mill standard uh, 1913 Picatinny rail, so you can throw a light on there, and I think it's tungsten gray, uh, Cerakote over phosphate. 
and AFC Magazine coating. Uh, and then a little special note, the TP9 SFX comes with two 20-round mags, poly holster, paddle belt attachment, interchangeable back straps, clean rod, brush, and a limited lifetime manufacturer's warranty. So, yeah. <laughs> and all that for, uh, and Adam couldn't join us. He was on a, so, um, do you know the retail on these things? What standard retail is? I want to say full MSRP on the pistol is in the neighborhood of 600, but it's significantly cheaper than that when you get it to, to the actual retail store and you're buying it new. Right. And so you get all that for, you know, under 600, probably around 500 bucks. Uh, when you go out and buy it at, uh, at the retail. But, uh, I mean, that's, that's unbelievable. If you go and you take any other gun and you've got this, I mean, for instance, a Glock, I mean, you're looking at a $1,200 gun or more. It's crazy. And, and Nils is living proof that he's beating all those other guns, hands down. <laughs> Yeah, last year was pretty fun. I went uh, and shot every national championship I could uh, squeeze into my schedule and ended up finishing uh, third and second uh, at the Carry Optics USPSA Nationals and the Production USPSA Nationals. So That's all awesome. but one or two guys uh, met their defeat. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. That is awesome. All right, so uh, just, just to be clear, we're going to go over the rules one more time. Uh, so Canic Nils, is putting out a, a series of videos and the name of those videos again are yeah the video series is called quick tips in quarantine and through that video series we discuss topics like dry fire and match preparation and just things you can improve at home and while you're locked at home stuck doing nothing you can get better in the process so we go through all sorts of topics on it right and this is a this is going to be a continuing series right yeah, we're going to continue the series uh, probably until the, the lockdown or the stay-at-home orders are uh, taken out of effect. There you go. And uh, to date, as we're recording now, I think there are seven of those out. So if, if you missed one, because a lot of you kind of jumped the gun and you went ahead, but as long as you got that one special video that, you know, that had the the, the Sunday punch in it, the special two items that you're supposed to find, then we'll allow that. So if you miss the seventh, uh, seventh one, you know, I mean, you're going to be okay. Um, so to date, what we've got, and I've gone through all our, all our entrants. Uh, so what you had to do was you had to share those videos and it could be on Instagram. It could be on fa Facebook. So you had to reshare all those. And then you had to tag Nils, Canic, and Talking Lead. And when I say tag, that's not a hashtag. It's not hashtag us. It's tagging is you got to use that. Is it ampersand or what? the at symbol? The at symbol, yeah. The at symbol. Uh, and then put the name in there. So if you don't know how to do that, you should have just Googled it because it was, it was easy, <laughs> easy to find out. So it's your own bad if you didn't do it properly. So if you just hashtagged us and you didn't tag us, then eh, you, you didn't get qualified. Uh, and then in addition, and you had to do it on each one of those. And then in addition to that, uh, you had to follow us. So you got to follow each of our pages and it could be on Instagram or Facebook. If you did both, then great. Perfect. We appreciate the extra follows there. Uh, and then what you had to do is you had to send me an email, talking at gmail.com. And you had to tell me what each of the episodes, what the topic was. And then in that special uh video which i believe it was the one on the draw is that right yes it was the draw video uh we had special items that were in there and we gave you clues as to what to look for too i gave you several clues on the show and uh, through social media posts that i did and you had a rubber chicken and you had some toilet paper and he made it very obvious <laughs> <laughs> so if you missed it which one of you guys, I mean, you sent it in like three times, three different guesses on what the items were, and you didn't, get, you did, still didn't get it right. Bless your heart. Um, but, uh, I we, mean, we said it in episode 344, right? Right. We told him it was going to be chicken in some way and toilet paper. Well, I actually bleeped it out when we actually said it, but at the end oh. of the, at the end of that show, I gave hints. Because okay. I, because I, I, because I said chicken, and I said I think we said toilet paper too. But anyway, 
the majority of you got it right. So as I'm going through here to date uh, that got it in, and some of you just made it under the deadline, like three of you right before we started recording. So I actually just got a notification on my Facebook. Do you have Jonathan Gallup? Yes. There? Giddy okay. up. Yeah. So he just uh, he just shared a whole bunch of stuff, so I wanted to make sure that Jonathan... And he's the one I'm well. talking about that, just, okay, that just got it in under the wire. He's a long-time leadhead, so I would have been disappointed if he hadn't have made it in. But we've got 16 counting Giddy up. So uh, what I've done is I've gone through here and I've put all the names down. Uh, and I did this prior just uh, to save time because Neil's uh, is limited on some time here. So uh, I'm going to go through and read your name. And I randomly generated a 1 through 16 numbers for each of you. Uh, and then I assigned those numbers to you. So, And I'm not going to read your last names either because uh, I don't know if some of you want your last names uh, uh, read or not. But you're going to know who you are. So the first one is John. I'm going to say Don. That's part of your last name. John Don. You're 14. Frajole Breeze which we had a, a fun time with your name last episode for Hole. Uh, and that's uh, it's a code name. I know that. So uh, it means bean fart. <laughs> it's for Hole. Of course it does. Breeze. Uh, that's funny. He's number seven. Casey, La, uh, Casey L. Sorry. Casey L. is number 11. Jason E. is number nine. Jerry B is number two. Creek Jeep is number one. Jason F. is number four. Mustang Perry, which is also Michael Perry. I think I've read your name several times on here anyway, so I don't think you care. Or Michael P. will call you. You're 16. Travis M., uh, who is a USMC, former USMC, is number 10. Mark and Lacey, H, are 15. Daniel N is 8. Thomas C is 13. Ed Drig, I'm going to call you. That's not your last party. It's part, you know who you are. You're number 5. David R is number 6. Ed B is number 3. And Giddy Up. You're number 12. So that should be... I, did, did you hear me repeat any numbers? I'm pretty sure I got uh, 1 through 16, and we didn't repeat any numbers or or anything. Sounds there. good to me. You lost track after the first... You lost, uh, you lost <laughs> me after the first couple. <laughs> yeah. So th that's your that's your numbers. So here's, here's how we're going to do this. So Niels has a, a number... Random number generator. You know, this is how I do my giveaways, guys. So... And it's a, I think it's a Google one, and he's doing the spin, the wheel spin. So here's what we're going to do. To make this fair, he's going to, first spin is going to determine how many spins we do to determine the winner. So he's going to do a num, uh, random number generator, and if it comes up eight, then we're going to spin it eight times, and that eighth number is going to be the winner. Make sense? All right. If it doesn't, too bad. <laughs> this is how we're doing it. Uh, this is the fairest way that I, I can think to do it. And it takes me out of it. Niels is doing it. He's in a whole other uh, state there uh, away from me. So That's right. You're over 1,000 miles away, so you can't influence my random number generator from where you're at. <laughs> not, that I, not that I know how to do. I mean, some of these smart guys <laughs> might know how, but I don't know how to do it. So. All right, let's let's start off. What's the? All right, let's do let's do the first number. This will determine how many spins we're gonna do. All right, here we go. Spinning. Eleven. Okay. All right, we're gonna spin it eleven times. Now here's here's what what I was debating over with with Niels is whether we should read each spin and what the number would have been just to agonize some people. <laughs> All right, you ready? All right, so you tell me when you spin it, and I'll count. Let's do it. All right, here's the first spin. spin. First time. The first number is seven. Okay. Second spin. Six. 
second number. Eight. All right. Third spin. Now, you're not winning anything. He's calling these numbers. These are just, just what the numbers are. The 11th spin is who the winner is. Number is eight. So the th second and third spin were both eight, huh? Okay. There we go, number four. Number four. Dun, dun, dun. Five. Okay. Now the fifth spin. Four. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now the sixth spin. spin. Number six. Number six, baby. Four again. Wow. Jason, number seven. Jason F is shitting his pants. <laughs> <laughs> Seventh spin. Is number seven. Okay. Now on to number eight. Number eight. Ocho. Come on. I bet it's a seven for Frijole Breeze. Ocho. Dose. Dose. Okay. All right. On to number nine. Spin is still spinning. A six. Six. Okay. Number ten. Number ten coming up. We're one number away. Seven. Oh wow. Okay. So that means the next number that we spin is going to be here. It the is the winner of the Canic TP9 SFX. Hold on to your britches. Here it comes. Here we go. All right, um, he's showing it to me on Skype. It's spinning. Spin, boop, boop, boop. I'll put a sound effect in there. <laughs> boop, boop, boop. Uh, number one. Number one. <laughs> <laughs> number one, Creek Who's number Jeep. One? Creek Jeep is the winner. You just won a brand new Canic TP9 SFX. Very nice. Very cool. So as we've stated the entire time, you have to be eligible to own a firearm to win this. So if you're not, and uh, you know, we'll have to give to somebody else, we'll give you a consolation prize. Uh, but if you are, uh, either way, shoot me an email, talkinglet at gmail.com. Let me know. And of course, we're going to need your FFL information, but I'm going to put you in touch with Adam at, at Century Arms slash Canic USA, and uh, he will get all the information that he needs. But wow, guys, thank you so much for all the participation. Uh, this was amazing. So we're, uh, we're just happy to be here and happy to help out the shooting community. I mean, it's awesome to be able to give away some guns. Absolutely. And, you know, that, like we said, that Canic TP9 SFX, uh, even though, you know, it's the sticker on that's like around 500 bucks, it's, it's well into the range of what should be a $1,200 gun. So you're going to be very happy with this Canic. So if you weren't a winner and you like a Canic, I mean, they're very affordable. Like we were just saying, this is like one of their top of the lines, got all the bells and whistles. You can get one of their standard ones for, you know, somewhere under what, south of $400 or somewhere. Yeah, we've got the one series, which uh, we've got that for our new subcompact Canic, as well as our standard SF and our elite models. And they're closer to the realm of the $300 level. And it's just the pistol, the pistol case, and one magazine. Yeah. But if you want to get in for a really affordable price and with a high-quality pistol, that's a great way to go. Yeah. You're still getting the, the great trigger pull, the barrel, uh, you know, the, the quality. Uh, are they all amb ambidextrous? I can't remember if they were all that way or not. But. All of the magazine releases are going to be uh, adjustable. So if you're left-handed, you can pull it from the left side of the gun over to the right side of the gun. Uh, the SF... Um, series pistols mm -hmm. that is not a ambidextrous slide release however all the elite series guns do have an ambidextrous slide release yeah. which is what i've got right here i was showing uh Niels earlier and this actually isn't my um combat elite i borrowed it from uh my good buddy drew we went out and shot this past weekend and uh, until adam sends me mine i was like hey let me borrow that one and uh, let me get some dry firing drills with it. So when mine gets here, I'll be pretty proficient with it by then. So um, thank you, Drew, for letting me borrow your uh, your Canic. But, I mean, it's sweet. And uh, we took it out, and, I mean, I was 
I was killing the targets with this thing. It's it's amazing. I ne I'm never disappointed when I take the Canix out and shoot them. Always a good time. So there you go. Congratulations to Creek Jeep. Again, talkingletgmail.com. Shoot me your contact info, and we'll put you in touch with Adam over there, and he'll make sure you get that. Wow. So like we mentioned earlier, I mean, there's still more to give away here at the Talking Lead Podcast. So stay tuned. Nils, thank you so much for participating with us. Uh, those videos that you guys are doing over there are really good, really high quality videos and full of information that you you lead heads need to be sharing with your family and friends and loved ones. Don't, uh, don't waste this opportunity to, to learn while you're cooped up in quarantine. You know, have fun, stay safe. And uh, be superior. <laughs> Very good. Very good. So, congratulations to Creek Jeep. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, and that's his uh, Instagram name. Oh, okay. <laughs> it, it's his, his Instagrams. Thank God, because I thought that guy's parents hated him. So, don't be mad if you didn't win this one, because we've got another giveaway coming up soon with the... Chad, CP33. Keltec CP33, 22 long rifle pistol. Talk about that real quick. Yeah, so it's a it's a CP stands for competition pistol and 33 stands for 33 rounds. So it comes with two 33 round magazines and uh, it's got a nine inch, uh, yeah, I think it's got a nine inch sight radius, uh, fiber optic sights that are adjustable and uh, it's got sort of this cool almost ar style charging handle mm -hmm. uh it's a it's a, if you if you don't if you've never seen one google keltec cp33 uh it's a really really cool gun i always say it's like the mullet pistol uh <laughs> because the receiver sticks out way over your hand and it's like business in the front and party, party in, the in the back i love it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so so yeah again we're going to be giving that away with a custom mission first tactical holster uh dave edelman over there those guys are going to be putting a custom I call it paint job on the holster, and uh, hopefully they're going to have the the time when they get back to uh, finish the CP33 and put some kind of cool scheme on that as well. Fioki Ammo is going to be uh, including a certificate for some 22 ammo. Buck Knives is throwing in a fixed blade knife. Keltec's throwing in one of their their cool flashlights. What's this model called that you? That is the. Uh cl 43 okay is that the one you sent do you know i don't it's either the 42 or 43 the difference is is the 42 has the tail cap on the back okay and the cl 43 that you have there has it's like a pistol style trigger yeah this is the one i've got i love this one yeah so you're gonna be getting one of those i don't know which one it is um Either way, it's the same 450 lumens yeah so. they're still bright uh and then uh smith bradley watches is throwing in one of their their cool watches. I think it's the Springfield. But once David gets back into the office, we're gonna we're gonna get all the exact information and details out to you guys uh, on that and what you got to do to to be eligible. So lots of cool stuff coming from Talking Lead and our friends and sponsors of the show. Keltec being uh, one of our sponsors. Thank you guys so much for stepping up and making this show possible for us in the Leadhead Brigade and rewarding them. Thank you and your listeners for keeping this whole Second Amendment thing going. Yeah, man, absolutely. And, uh, guys, uh, make sure you go and support those that are supporting the Talking Lead podcast. Go show Caltech some love on their social media, on their website, uh, and the best love that you can show them is go to your local gun store and buy a CP33, an RDB, an RFB, a KSG, your pistol line. You've got several pistols. Talk about those. Yeah, we've got uh, P32s, P38T, P38Ts, PF9s. Uh, you know everything from 32 to nine millimeter. Actually, 22. 22. To, yeah. Yeah. Go show them some love there. Uh, Fioki Ammo. Go let them know how much you appreciate them. And uh, I mean, their ammo is is great. I just took out the 308. Like I said the other day, and I've uh, been trying out their 308 ammo. Uh, and uh, I mean, I'm putting holes in holes with this stuff at, you know, two, 300 yards, no problem with my 308. So no joke. I actually wish I had the box here right with me right now, but that's all I ran yesterday was uh Fioki, uh, two, two, three. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah or 
their five five six stuff. But uh, yeah, it was it was awesome. Yeah, good good quality yeah, ammo there. Too. It is. It's really good quality. Go go show Fioki some love. Modern Spartan systems don't just clean your firearms. Optimize them with Modern Spartan Systems line of cleaning products and and of course their accuracy oil. Uh, when you get a new rifle, you want to use that Modern Spartan Systems accuracy oil, and it definitely will make your pistol, your rifle, even more accurate. I need that. It's good stuff. I'm awful. Have I not I'm... ever sent you any? I got to send you some. <laughs> No, I'm just really terrible. I need all the accuracy help I can get. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Uh, no doubt. Uh, and then, of course, Mission First Tactical. If you guys want one of our cool dump trays or tactical wallets, you can go to their website, uh, and they're going to have our classic logo, and then they've got the AK Corner version uh, of those as well, so you can get those at Mission First. In addition to the holsters that they make, the pepper spray, that they've got there, uh, all their cool line of products, the AR accessories, the butt stocks, the hand guards. I've got some hand guards coming in from Dave. I'm going to be doing a LEO takedown um, conversion on a 5.56, a 6.5 Grendel, and 300 Blackout. So we're going to do a little video on that, show you guys uh, the, the cool thing about the LEO takedown system that they've got there coming up. Very nice. Very, very nice. But that does it for another episode of the Talking Lead Podcast. Chad, I'm glad you guys uh, had had the opportunity to get on this time. I know that you were doing some some work there with the product pictures and being Mr. GQ and all. <laughs> yeah, well, I wasn't the model. I was actually the photographer. On oh, you were the photographer. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's a switch for you. You're, you're the face of Caltech, man. Oh, uh, no. I used a really good friend of mine. He's a, he's a handsome man. All right. Well, there you go. Coming soon. I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> you talk about me and my white claws. Come on. <laughs> uh, always a good time, brother. Absolutely. Until the next episode, as always, lead heads, keep your loved ones close. Keep your firearms even closer. And you can do that by getting a bullpup. <laughs> That's true. Both figuratively and technically. No, it's a uh, MacBook Pro. Oh, you're using the Apple shit. Okay. Yeah. I'm a Windows guy. You are? Yeah. I drink White Claws, don't have any tattoos, and I like Windows. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe we're still friends. <laughs> well, I'm not a liberal, so that's probably what, what it is. All Damn. that, and you think you think I'd be a liberal. <laughs> the white claws for sure. <laughs> <laughs>